This video is sponsored by Skillshare. What interests you? The city. Why? Because no one's ever captured it. Not the way it really is. The heart of it. That's my goal, that's my dream. The Midnight Metrian is a far better film than I remember. In fact, at face value, it doesn't seem like much until you start getting into the finer details. It tells the story of Leon, a street photographer looking to make a name for himself in the higher social circles of the New York art scene, who becomes obsessed with a mysterious man who he believes is responsible for the various disappearances happening around town. Of course, he would be right, as the titular Midnight Metrian is made abundantly clear from the opening. This big, brooding beast of a man enters the same train at the same time each night and murders anyone aboard. It knows exactly what kind of story it wants to tell, and is executed with a unique and unexpected visual intelligence underneath the surface that helps you buy into its increasingly grotesque madness. Now, just to be clear, I can't show you many of the specific killings because the Midnight Metrian isn't afraid to show you every squeamish and squishy detail of this buff bastard's butchering. The film was marketed purely on its unapologetically gory indulgence that sometimes borders on cartoonish, but to its credit, it clearly channels its inner 80s inspired Evil Dead by giving Ted Raimi of all people the most cinematically over the top death. All I'm saying is, YouTube hates this type of content, and working a blur filter around all the mutilated naked corpses and flying body parts is a censorship job from hell, but I have a few workarounds, and to be honest, to bar some explicit scenes, it's not as constant as I remember. The Midnight Metrian is a lot more than just your average murder boy splatter flick. After all, this is a Clive Barker adaptation we're dealing with, so nothing is as simple as it seems. At the heart of it is a minimalistic character journey about casual subconscious voyeurism. In an age where recording every provocative moment began taking precedence over moral respect for our surroundings, before derailing as the brutal, sinister revelations begin to take shape. However, before we jump aboard, if you're looking to discover your creativity, improve your craft, or simply indulge in something new and exciting, then Skillshare is here to help. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes that offer practical and inspiring advice to beginners, veterans, and the broadly curious alike on a variety of topics including filmmaking, writing, illustration, music, to even lifestyle and productivity. Skillshare is about making the most of your time by continuously launching new premium classes which include reviews resources and the ability to engage in discussion with fellow creatives, in addition to live classes to further establish meaningful real-time and real-world connections. And best of all, it is completely ad-free. I know, what kind of sorcery is that? Currently, I'm actually in the process of moving, and designing and decorating my office space was going pretty badly. However, after listening to Emily Henderson's class on style your space, creative tips and techniques for interior design, I felt more encouraged to be less conservative with colour and lighting, while making more efficient use of my space. In fact, once it's fully complete, I'll maybe share it on social media. The first 1,000 of my subscribers who click the link in the description box below will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. While The Midnight Metrian was very well received upon its release in 2008, I wouldn't be surprised if the comments for this one are fairly polarizing because the character drama and violence do feel like two tonally different films clashing with each other, but I do have a defense for this, but I can't really talk about it until the spoiler section. So for context, I always mistakenly thought that The Midnight Metrian was a direct-to-video release given it had all the markings of one, but with a budget and talent pool that far exceeded the usual random video store rental. That's because, well, it was quickly dumped to DVD following a low-effort theatrical release from Lionsgate, with Barker claiming that then-president Joe Drake was flogging movies to the wayside in favour of giving attention to films he had his own name attached to, such as The Strangers. I mean, there was no guarantee The Midnight Metrian would have been a success, but there was definitely overlooked potential seeing as it fit perfectly into the then-current trend of gory splatter flicks popularised by Lion Gate's own cash cow franchise Saw. 
Hell, in hindsight, if it was shelved for another year or two, the Midnight Meat Train could have easily have been post-converted into 3D to capitalise on another trend that was about to re-emerge with the release of Avatar. Anyway, the film is very much in the same vein as 1408, where it takes a fairly straightforward short story and successfully adapts it into something with additional substance. It more or less follows every beat from Barker's story from Volume 1 of his anthology collection The Books of Blood, but I can't exactly get into it without spoiling the final act of the movie, so I'll come to it later. The first half focuses on Leon, played by then relatively unknown Bradley Cooper, as he obtains a meeting with a renowned gallery owner called Susan, who, if successful, will display his work to wealthy respected clientele and thus give Leon his desired big break in the industry. But Susan criticises Leon's photography as too safe and uninspired and encourages him to be brave, take risks and keep following the story to its very end until he captures the perfect moment. The next time you find yourself at the heart of the city, stay put, be brave, keep shooting. It effectively establishes Susan as this indirect moral catalyst to Leon's journey. When you read into why Leon's work is rejected, it's ultimately because she thinks he's too morally invested in not wanting to breach boundaries or intrude on people's privacy. Leon doesn't chase or stalk his subjects. He respects his distance as a harmless street photographer and is set up to be just an all-round decent, humble human being. But after receiving this feedback, it seems to trigger something in Leon. He becomes a restless nightcrawler who grows more disconnected from his surroundings and tries to see the world through only the literal objective lens of his camera. Yet, he continues to conflict with this dispassionate coldness Susan encourages, as there's a scene early on where Leon encounters a mugging, and after photographing the subject, he intervenes, claiming that while most would run away, he didn't, reinforcing his strong emotional involvement and feeling of responsibility, which is perhaps too much in the eyes of the gallery owner he's trying to impress. I'm not holding my breath on that one. A tad too bleak. The following day, Leon discovers that the subject of his photo has went missing, and immediately goes to Detective Lynn Hadley, who questions why he just coldly photographed the girl when he knew she was actively being assaulted. But you did continue to photograph her. Well, yeah, yeah, but I guess so, but... What? His response is that he doesn't know why he did it. He's once again stunned by this moral enquiry as he realises he did something completely out of character. And it's this incredibly subtle sense of discomfort that permeates the rest of Leon's journey. Bradley Cooper adds all these little expressions to show a man who is gradually becoming doubtful of himself. It relies on a simple script that's carried further by the show Don't Tell Nature of his performance. Here's the thing, we can sit and dig into the morals and meaning of the story, and that's fine because it's interesting and harmless to your enjoyment of the movie, but at the end of the day, what makes Leon a likeable protagonist is that he's just what you see. There's no big dark secret or traumatic backstory, he's just your average guy going through life without some deep complex existential burden. His life is content, he has great trustworthy friends, he's in a healthy relationship, he enjoys his work and seems to have a livable income for someone who lives in New York. In other words, he clearly has his shit together. However, where his peace of mind is disrupted is in his heightening ambitions. That is, because he is being led down a road that seems to challenge his inner philosophical rules and gradually interferes with his personal life, cracks begin to emerge in his perception of reality. What makes you happy? What do you love? You, I love you. Perhaps his content life isn't so content. Maybe he isn't happy. Maybe he is being held back. Could it be these lines of moral questioning were what was needed for him to finally see his life for what it truly is? You were right. That's all I wanted to say. Now, before y'all go, uh, Ryan, it's called The Midnight Metrian, dial it back a bit. Again, let me stress, this is based on a Clive Barker story. 
Inevitably, there is going to be an element of punishment and madness to it. Sure, it doesn't reach the extremes of Lovecraft, but it's cool how it frames Leon as just some random, insignificant guy who literally puts himself into harm's way just for a few pictures, hoping there's something grander or fulfilling at the end of it. The underlying theme of the story is basically morbid fascination. Leon follows the story not because he wants to solve the mystery or save the day, but because he's just curious. Like I said in the opening, the film taps into the increasing voyeuristic tendencies of people who feel an urge to capture what's going on rather than realizing what's going on. It's visually evident in Leon's increasingly obsessive behaviour. In a state of poetic irony stemming from Susan's encouragement, he begins stalking the butcher and becomes more sexually intense with his girlfriend Maya, along with some other uh, phallic symbols that foreshadow Leon's growing lust for the macabre. He quickly and subconsciously loses interest in his main objective, because after impressing Susan following one night of photography, it starts to mean nothing to him as his newfound emotional investment comes solely from wanting to observe this one man, who potentially represents a dark symbol of what Leon desires to be. I'm sorry mister, I, uh, I just wanted a picture of you. Sometimes I don't know what I'm thinking. Now is the last stop for anyone wanting to avoid spoilers because I do want to talk about The Butcher but this does involve getting into the story's big bad revelation so brace yourself. The Butcher himself, named Mahogany, does begin to get more independent screen time as the film moves along. While Vinnie Jones perfectly plays the typecast of the big bulky bastard you aren't gonna fuck with, it's quite shocking to discover that he does have some emotional depth behind his character. For most of the movie, he's just a cold, menacing motherfucker who batters his victims with a mallet, removes their teeth and fingernails, hangs them up like it's a meat locker, and then proceeds to go to work as, well, a butcher in a meat factory. What a surprise! You can tell there's something not quite human about him, especially during one scene where he cuts these bits of fungus off his skin and collects them, which I don't think ever gets explained. In fact, generally speaking, his character is left largely ambiguous, as the only real detail to truly stand out is that he gradually begins to show weakness as the kills continue. Eventually, we discover that the train conductor is in cahoots with Mahogany. After shooting a passenger Mahogany struggles to kill, exposing a strangely sensitive and vulnerable side to him. I'll admit, I actually started to feel kinda sorry for him. Like with Cooper's performance, there are times where Vinnie Jones portrays the butcher with expressions that suggest he is internally struggling and doesn't want to do this. It's almost like he's being forced by the conductor and this does make sense when we finally get to the next bit. Okay, so this is where things go off the reels for many people. The grand reveal is that the goal of the killers is to feed these ancient creatures living beneath the city who threaten humanity with supposedly devastating unstoppable powers. Yeah, I'll give you a moment. Personally, I didn't really mind this reveal, but I can definitely see why many people will absolutely loathe it, even if I do disagree that it felt like a sudden U-turn. Like I said earlier, the fact that it feels like two tonally different films means I felt prepared for something bizarre like this to happen, and again, it's adapted by the guy who made Hellraiser, so I guess I was already prepared regardless. I was initially put off by the goofy CG slaughter in what was a very self-serious film, but as the story goes along and the occult stuff kicks in, it felt more like a risky but clever creative choice by the filmmakers to help suspend your disbelief when things get super far-fetched. At some point, the butcher has Leon marked by the creatures, much to both their dismay, as Leon has been chosen to succeed the now withering mahogany, but must first prove his strength by defeating the butcher in trial. It also seemed to me that because of Mahogany's emotional awareness despite his cold exterior, he was once in Leon's position, just an ordinary guy who was lured into taking over from a previous butcher, and the cycle goes back hundreds of years and eventually someone will take over from Leon. 
There's a point where Leon just becomes a zombie, as his girlfriend Maya takes over the investigation, but he does seem to break the spell when he witnesses Maya in danger, thus suggesting his emotions were the force that had to be broken, much like how Mahogany's growing emotions began to weaken him. When you think about it, Leon's journey ultimately saw him be slowly stripped of his humanity. His loved ones are butchered and his tongue is torn out as a mark of obedience and unopposed blind acceptance to this cult's continued efforts to feed these creatures. I guess part of it goes back to Leon's initial purpose to create meaningful profound work, where his destiny has now been twisted into a purpose that's supposedly far more important. Oh, and Detective Hadley is also involved so that the cult has an insider who can disrupt any attempts to properly investigate the multitude of nightly disappearances. However, just before we end, I can also see why fans of Clive Barker might not like the ending either, because it is left more ambiguous and simplified than the short story, which sees the creatures presented more as a colony of elders who rule the city, adding a greater illusion of power over humanity. In this context, it makes the movie's interpretation pretty disappointing, because they just look like generic ravenous monsters as opposed to some cosmic entity who could conceivably do us all. And with that, I hope that feeds the craving many have for me to cover more cosmic horror stuff. I thought I'd kill a few birds with one stone by covering what you could call a cosmic slasher, which kind of fits with the topics I've been covering this year. So in the comments below, let me know your thoughts on the Midnight Metrian, and if you have a recommendation for a film that has an unexpected final act, let me know about it as well. And until next time, stay safe, stay off the Midnight Train and I'll see you all very soon.